Good evening. I would like to call to order the Wyndham Raymond School District Board of Directors meeting. It is 6.30 on Wednesday, December 16th, 2020. We are in the Zoom video conferencing. Mr. Howell? Kate Bricks? Here. Jenny Butler? Here. Jenny Cummings? Here. Marge Gavoni? Here. Pete Hensler? Here. Anna Keeney? Kate Levier, Scott McLean, Christina Small. Here. And Molly Cochran. Here. Okay, we are now, we'll have a guest person doing the Pledge of Allegiance. Will you all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Mm -hmm. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic America. for which it stands, one nation under, under God, God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. Thank you, Denali. Okay, uh, Mr. Howell, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Mrs. Cummings, there are no adjustments tonight. The agenda is how it was published. Okay, thank you. It's now an opportunity for public input when the public can comment on items not on the agenda. Would any public like to input? Okay, seeing none. It's my very great delight at introducing the Wyndham Chamber Singers and Rick Nickerson is going to give us a presentation. Oh. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> okay, yes. Well, thank you. We uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to come before you. Uh, as you know, in, in a typical year, December is a, um, a very busy month for us. Uh, that has not obviously been the case this year. Uh, as we took our, typical, or our regular American family holiday concerts and took it online. Uh, we did a YouTube premiere. And in a, uh, in a year where everything has gone as unexpected as possible. Uh, in, when we premiered this video, we were in the middle of uh, a major snowstorm where most of the state lost power and wasn't able to view uh, this concert when it aired. Uh, last I checked, we have, uh, I think, close to 4,000 views. Uh, so it's really been, really been exciting. Uh, I hope you all had the chance to see it. Uh, it uh, uh, we had a lot of collaboration, a lot of uh, alumni that came back and, and you know, offered different contributions. Uh, uh, we had many of the uh, items that we, or many of the uh, events that typically happen at our American Family Holiday Concerts uh, were a part of this. And I know I speak for many of you uh, when I say even watching it from home, it still felt kind of like AmFam. Mm -hmm. And I do have, uh, the, the, the three students I brought with me tonight are all seniors. Uh, who are officers, and they are four-year officers. So this is their fourth year in the group, uh, Megan Messenger, Denali Dumagard, and Olivia Elder. And I would like uh, to, th for them to do most of the talking and talk about their experience or how we put this together uh, and just maybe what they learned from, from the whole experience. So uh, I don't know who wants to go first. I can go first. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Denali Dumagard. I'm this year's president. Um, I definitely am so grateful that Dr. Nick found a way for us to do a um, Christmas performance this year uh, because, I mean, it's definitely a big deal for us fellow chamber singers and also I feel for the public. <laughs> um, and some valuable things that I think all of us in the group learned this year was um, just like anything is possible if you set your mind to it. Um, I definitely wouldn't have imagined that last year that uh, for AmFam or MainFam this year, we would have been online and we would have been successful at it <laughs> um, and how great technology really is. Um, I'm not very uh, good at technology and all that. So I was honestly amazed this year how much we could do. Um, I also thought it was amazing that I haven't been able to meet everybody in the group and yet I've been able to um, meet people online um, instead of in person and get to know them and get to know their strengths and um, who they are as a singer. And that's really amazing. Um, that technology has brought us this close. Um, 
And yeah, and I just think, although it's not what we expected, there were some uh, major things that we wouldn't have been able to do if we did it uh, in person. Like I had family from Pennsylvania, New York, Hawaii, even watching um, main fam, and that wouldn't have been able to happen in previous years. So I'm very grateful for that, definitely. Thanks, Tanali. I'll go next. Um, I'm Olivia Elder. I'm this year's vice president and I'm a senior, like Dr. Nick said. Um, this year has been um, honestly quite the learning curve. Like I've learned a lot this year, um, not only about my myself, but about what I am capable of as a person. And I've also seen um, our group grow. Like from the beginning, I've just seen everybody um, come out of their shells more, even though we aren't in person, which has been incredible. Um, I think that main fam definitely, uh, main fam was a challenge, but it was a challenge that I'm proud that I was a part of. Um, it really, it showed me that like Denali said, anything is possible. And I think that that's something that um, just, that doesn't really cross their mind. They just assume, oh, I can't do that. Like, oh, we're not gonna do that. That's not possible. But like, it totally is. <laughs> um, and I just think that coming together as a group and putting on this concert was um, honestly one of the best parts of my year. Like, it was a very surreal moment when um, I sat down with my family on the couch to watch the concert. And um, as vice president, I run the social media. So I saw so many notifications coming in of people sharing their Instagram stories with us um, and like showing us how they were um, experiencing man, uh, main fam. And it was just so cool to be able to see all the love pouring in on our Instagram account. Um, and Dr. Nick um, got a lot of love on our Facebook as well. And that was just so cool. And surreal thing that we all worked really hard for so it was just in general such a great experience and um speaking for the group we are all so thankful for everybody who supported us even through this um really difficult time so yeah thank you Livia so I guess it's my turn yeah um well I just looking back on this experience I I remember um, going back to freshman year and thinking, oh my gosh, I, I, I can't wait to be a senior. It's going to be so amazing. It's, we're going to get to do all this stuff. And, you know, like we're going to get to sit uh, in front of the stage and listen to Kim um, tell the story of Charlie Brown, you know, like uh, we, we just, we just had all these things that we were looking forward to. And then when we weren't able to do it, it was a shock um, for all of us. But you know what? Looking back on it, I really wouldn't change this opportunity um, because I think it shows how we persevered, you know? Um, I think a lot of people have had a really hard time this year. Um, I mean, we all know this to be true. Um, and we really, really needed to put something out there for people to, to watch and get through the holidays and see the, the togetherness and the, the work that, that we really put in for, for not only ourselves, but everybody else. You know, I, I think that we, that we needed to do that. And Dr. Nick and everybody else who was involved in this production, whether they're singers or people behind the scenes, they all worked tirelessly um, to put all this together. And I mean, I'm, I'm with Denali. I, I never thought that it could have been, you know, this amazing or this big, but I mean, like they're right. We had people watching in Italy and the Czech Republic and people just all around the world watching this. And I just think that it's, 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 it's just an amazing experience for people that we've created. And I'm really proud of everybody that was a part of it and everybody who has the privilege to watch. Uh, if if I may, I, I, I have to just say, uh, as I sit here, I, I'm just having one of those teacher moments where I'm starting to, my lips starting to quiver and I'm just starting to well up because I just, <laughs> as I hear my students talk, I, it just makes me so proud. Um, so, but uh, if you're not familiar with, with what we did or how we do the virtual choir, uh, the I think Denali referenced earlier that we have not met in person. We did do a meeting last fall on the, on the baseball field. That was more of a social meeting. It wasn't really a rehearsal. 
we, everything that we rehearse for this show, we've learned online. We were, our rehearsals look exactly like this meeting looks, uh, except that we can't all have our microphones on because everybody has different bandwidth. So if we try to sing together, it doesn't line up and it's, it's just a total disaster. Um, so we learn the music this way and then they will using a, uh, what we call a click track that I provide them with, which might be me conducting, it might be just me counting off. They'll sing along to that click track, recording just themselves singing. That in itself is incredibly intimidating because much of what much of what uh, you know is inherent in our group is, is you know, just being an ensemble. We rely on the strength of others to build us up, but suddenly they're very alone, and it uh, it's uh, it really it, it makes you feel very vulnerable. Uh, so this is what they do. Uh, and then they send those to me and then I line them up, which is kind of a microcosm of what I, what I do in rehearsal. Uh, I, and I can, I can actually take out wrong notes and change vowels and things like that. And so uh, it, uh, it's not the best case scenario, but I, I think it's worth noting that this uh, 72 minute concert that we put together was put together by a choir that's never rehearsed together. Uh, in fact, we have members of the chamber singers who've ne never met one another. Amazing. So it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, and the high, the high point for me, uh, yeah, and even though I put it together, I will admit I, I got choked up and had tears streaming down my face uh, was at the very end when all the alumni came in and it was just one screen of uh, just all literally students from all over the world. We had uh, you know, students from Europe that had sent in their contribution. And that's, that's kind of uh, our big thing. So I, if you haven't seen it, I hope you do get the opportunity to see it. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions. So I have one more thing I wanted to say, but I'll defer if anybody has any questions as to what we do. I think we're set. Okay. So uh, can I have can I have five? Five. Five. Is that sure. okay? No, Mr. Howell didn't know I was going to. Do this. Um, it, it, we very much appreciate the opportunity to come uh, before you and, and, and talk about uh, the main family holiday concert. Uh, when we decided to do this, it was our objective to put something together that our community would enjoy and was representative of our live show. And I know I speak for all the singers when I say that we're glad you enjoyed the show and we hope it brought a glimmer of hope and happiness during this very dark time. However, Please don't assume that after seeing this, that things are okay with the chamber singers or with the performing arts students in general, because I assure you, they're not. Our performing arts students are tired, they're empty, they're withdrawn, they lack motivation and energy, and they feel that everything that's important to them has been taken away. They feel singled out and they feel ignored. These are not my words, these are the words of my students. While this final product was very re rewarding, the process of putting this together was nowhere near as rewarding. That's because at no time whatsoever were we together. This entire process locked the lacked the foundation of what our group has been built on, live human interaction. They miss in-person gatherings. They also notice when we, the adults, go out of our way to make sure that other activities are indeed offered. Even if that means that in order to offer these other activities, we ignore the same guidelines that prevent chamber singers from meeting in person. They see guidelines inconsistently applied and they ask questions. I'm not, read, I'm not saying this to you this evening with the expectation that you can change anything because I know this has to come from Augusta. But I do however feel that as a board of education, you need to know that emotionally, our students are not okay. This is the area that they've invested their time, energy, emotion and physical exertion, and their questions are largely ignored. In early October, the Maine Music Educators Association presented a document titled The Fall 2020 MMEA Guidance for Music Education, presented it to the state for their review. At their meeting on October 21st, the Sports Medicine Commit Committee of the Maine Principals Association offered their unanimous endorsement of this document. There has yet to be a formal response to this. As recently as this morning, we were given updated guidelines that again, ignored choral music. Whether or not our performing arts students are being ignored right now really isn't the issue because it is their perception. Our students are hurting and at the very least they deserve some answers. Thank you for your continued support. It is an honor to, to represent 
the Wyndham Rainey community. Thank you for your message and um, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the okay. to the chamber singers who are here. Um, we appreciate you and we respect your your the sacrifice of time and energy that you have given and we appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. And Thanks to Megan for making me cry. Just saying. Okay. Um, I guess it's time to move on to the um, auditor's report. Mr. Howell? You're still on mute. Mr. Sorry. Howell. Just realized that I was muted. Um, we have tonight with us Amy Chase from Runyon, uh, Kirstein, and Willette. Uh, Amy is our auditor who is responsible for guiding us throughout the year as issues come up and then also for coming on site and working with our business and finance staff uh, to go over our books to make sure that we're compliant with all federal and state statutes. Um, they are a joy and a pleasure to work with when they're here. Um, usually they camp out in one of the offices for a week or so and go through our books and, and make sure, but also just wanna thank Amy because Amy has been a great resource to the district, especially as we've had new challenges this year with new funds and with CRF and with CARES funds and how to properly make sure that um, we're recording all those expenditures and, and meeting all those guidelines. So Amy is going to be presenting her annual overview of where we are as a district and our financial position. And Amy, I've made you co-host, so you should be able to share your screen if you need to. Okay, I can, I can share the presentation that I have if you'd like, or I assume you, uh, you all have a digital copy, whatever, whatever you guys prefer. Amy, why don't you, for the sake of the public, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen? Sure. So they'd have a chance to see it. And board members, there is a copy in your board packet of, of um, Amy's presentation. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Can everybody see that presentation now? Yes. Okay. So first and foremost, I, I wanna thank Chris and Stacy, who is the district accountant. She has helped us tremendously make sure, both of them have helped us tremendously to make sure that the audit goes on as planned. The audit is done timely and in an efficient manner. Unfortunately, this year posed a little bit more of a challenge because of COVID and most of our audits have had to have been done uh, remotely, which definitely puts a burden on the auditors as well as uh, the central office staff because the central office staff, an audit is very overwhelming and does take a lot of their time in addition to their everyday duties that certainly do not stop. Um, luckily, we were able to get the audit for the district done earlier in its normal time frame, which um, happened to be a few days of interim towards the end of the month of May, which allows us to do a lot of internal control testing and compliance testing of the federal grants in which, um, can be done ahead of the time of time without the books being closed and then in august usually the first week of august we go to the district central office and perform a week of field work luckily the district was very welcoming to us we had our own conference room we were able to uh, properly socially distance and therefore that eliminated um the need for Stacy and the rest of the central office staff to scan a bunch of documents that are typically looked at for us. So that was, a, we were very appreciative of that. And I think that speaks to being able to get this audit done prior to its deadline of December 31st. So overall, despite COVID being a restriction, the audit did go very well. This tonight, I'm going to be presenting or giving a brief overview of the financial statement results of and, and focusing on the general fund as that is the largest fund and the fund that is uh, 
most important. On page two of this presentation is a brief overview of the summary of the audit results. First and foremost, the financial statement opinion on these financial statements was unmodified. An unmodified opinion simply means that you received a clean opinion and that the financial statements are fairly stated in accordance with generally accepted auditing principle. This is the opinion that everybody wants in their financial statements. In addition to the financial statement audit, we also prepare two compliance audits. One of those compliance audits is a government auditing standard audit. This is an audit where we are looking at the internal controls of the district and their financial reporting processes. The second compliance audit that we do is a, an audit in, in conformity with uniform guidance. That is a program specific audit of the federal of the federal grants. That is required because the districts expends more than 750,000 in federal grant funds. This year, the program that got tested was Title I. Title I received a clean opinion as well as we did not notate any compliance, ir, ir, um, compliance findings and therefore received a clean opinion. The report or the yellow, well, the yellow book audit, which, we, which is also known as the audit of government auditing standards, had no material weaknesses, but we did report two significant deficiencies. These significant defi deficiencies have been repeats for a number of years, and we'll probably continue to see those in the forthcoming years. And it is very common in, this isn't only in your district, it's very common in other districts. Segregation of duties, um, it's just not effective to add another person in the central office to properly segregate the duties in a way that would eliminate this comment. So, uh, like I said, it will be a repetitive comment. In addition, the other significant deficiency that we noted was preparation of the financial statements. In front of you, I'm sure you were given the financial statement audit. It's 50 to 60 pages worth of financial statement numbers along with financial statement disclosures. Again, it would not be cost effective or efficient to have Stacy prepare these financial statements and get her up to speed with all of the updated GASBs that keep coming out that need to be reported in these financial statements. As the auditors, we, because we do this every day, we are very familiar with the, the different type of GASBs that need to be reported in addition to how the various fund and government-wide financial statements have to be reported. Management does a thorough review of these financial statements and puts together what we call a management's discussion and analysis which can be found, I believe it's pages four through eight of the financial statement report. They review the financial statements in, in detail. So we, um, we are content with what we get from management. And um, this is just a significant deficiency that we are required to report. But again, you will see this um, probably each and every year. And again, it's not it's not something that you need to worry as a district. This is common amongst all other districts as well. In addition to these audits, we are required to test internal controls of the district. So we look at the various activity funds. We look at payroll disbursements. We look at cash receipts disbursements. And we look at ca uh, cash disbursements. And we test on a, on a sample basis, which is usually as required by our auditing techniques, a sample of 
40 transactions. And we go, we get documentation from central office as to the processes that the financial, that the district uses to, re, to report on their internal control and financial reporting processes. In, in testing all of these various controls at looking at the general cash disbursements, the general cash receipts and the payroll disbursements, we noted no issues of non-compliance. However, and I will go over this later, in the payroll test, there were three instances out of the 40 um, transactions that were tested that we noted there wasn't a second approval. I'll go into detail when I go over the management letter comment. Um, again, it's nothing to be worried about, but it's just a recommendation that we're asking for a second review to move forward. One of the improvements that I thought was significant this year was testing of activity funds. There, are, This district has a lot of activity funds because of all of the different schools um, involved in the district. In previous years, we've had issues with timely deposits. And that has been a repeat, a repetitive comment for many years. I wanna say that this year, we did not find in the testing that we performed at the, we performed testing at the Wyndham Middle School, Manchester Elementary and Raymond Elementary. And we also looked at the high school. Um, there were, we did not find any issues of untimely deposits. We were very happy with that. And I think over time, it's just been drilled and drilled and drilled that it's very important that deposits are made timely, um, checks are written, all the supporting documentation is provided, just as student activity funds can be an area where uh, that's more susceptible to fraud and we want to eliminate, you know, that's not what we're looking for. So you want to make sure that you really drill into the people that it's important to keep adequate records and not hold money in a desk drawer until everything is collected so you can make one deposit. Again, part, I think part of the results are the check deposit machines that most of the schools received. And also because of COVID, school ended kind of abruptly in March. So there's a lot of acti you know, activities that did not happen moving from mid-March through the end of the school year. I want to continue, I, I want, you know, Kristen Stacy to continue being advocates and stressing how important following these procedures are moving forward. And, you know, I don't know if um, Stacy has had time to do this or is doing it, but I know we've talked about potentially she would do surprise audits at some of these schools just to make sure that they're following procedures as they should. Um, I just I think that'd be a good recommendation to, to continue doing or potentially start just to ensure that these activity funds remain on track with following the proper procedures. The next slide shows a shows the trend of the general fund fund balance account in 2020 or ending fiscal year 2020, the general fund had a total fund balance of roughly $8.5 million. That was an increase over last year of approximately $1.1 million. In your, un, your, your total fund balance is broken out between unassigned fund balance and assigned fund balance. Your assigned fund balance of seven million that is shown on shown on this slide represents seven hundred fifty thousand that has been assigned to your subsequent fiscal twenty one budget, as well as approximately six point three million dollars that has been assigned to various capital projects that the district will be doing throughout the year. The state imposed a statute or a law a few years ago, and then suspended the law and reinstated it, I wanna say two years ago, where it 
requires the school district to have no more than 3% of their, ex their budgeted expenditures in unassigned fund balance. RSU 14 is in compliance with that requirement and that statute. Unfortunately, that doesn't leave a lot to leave, that doesn't leave a heavy balance in unassigned fund balance, but that is, that is the statute. And that statute does not apply to municipalities within the state, but just simply to school districts. But I'm happy to say that the school has met that requirement and their unassigned fund balance is under the 3% uh, requirement. Our next slide goes over the general fund revenues. Your intergovernmental revenues, which are primarily made up of your state subsidies, Medicaid reimbursements came in under budget. Again, that is primarily due to lower than expected revenues from your state agency clients and your state subsidy came in a little bit lower than what was originally budgeted. Your interest earned was over was exceeded its budget and that's simply due to greater than, greater than expected investment earnings. And your other revenues exceeded budget by approximately 111,000 that's due to the district receiving um, 28,500 more in auditorium rental fees, $8,500 in transportation fees, and again, $26,000 in insurance proceeds than what had originally been budgeted. Your expenditure categories, all came in under budget with the exception of facilities maintenance. And that simply was due to unanticipated costs for roof repairs and various heating and lighting projects that, were take, that took place in some of the school buildings. Again, we're gonna see you know, savings in 2020, which are primarily attributable to a decrease in salaries, bus drivers, field trips, all due to COVID. School had to end in March. School was held remotely and therefore many teacher positions may not have gotten filled. Um, no field trips, no bus um, busing costs, no fuel costs, which led to um, expenditures coming in on, under budget. This next slide is a revenue distribution slide, which just pretty much shows the percentage of your revenues, your total revenues that come from local assessments and your intergovernmental revenues. As you can see, the trend is very consistent for the past four years. This is a pie chart of how your expenditures, the percentage of your expenditures amongst the different cost centers. Then the next slide, page eight, compares 2019 to 2020. And there is nothing unusual here. The expenditures are pretty dead on and comparable to that of the prior year. There is nothing alarming here. Very consistent from year to year. And finally, the last page of this graph goes over your other funds, fund balances. Again, in your financial statements, you can find details on what is made up of this. But as you can see, it is very, your fund balances and all of your different special revenue accounts remains consistent from, from year to year. There's no, again, nothing unusual, nothing unusual over here. Are there any questions on this so far? The last thing I just want to review is I want to review the one management letter comment that we had. Um, and basically, it's nothing alarming. It's just a recommendation, uh, like I said, to have a second review of employee pay rates and some payroll deductions. Uh, 
As I mentioned earlier, as part of our payroll test, we selected 40 transactions, which is the sample size requirement for our audit because there are over 160 transactions um, in the that payroll transactions in the district. As part of those 40 selections, we noted three instances whereby the employees were paid an incorrect salary or had an incorrect amount of health insurance deductions remitted from their pay. Once we noted that, that was subsequently corrected. So no employees did not get paid more, get paid less. Everything was corrected by the district. But it is our recommendation that a second review be done of these payroll, the payroll costs and the health, the salary costs and the health deductions that are entered manually into the um, accounting software each and every summer once the new, the teacher contracts come out. We just wanna make sure it's easy to get a, a transposition or miss an individual. And we just think if, if a second review was done, these types of minor errors could be eliminated. Um, so once we, once we brought this to management's attention, it was subsequently corrected. And with Stacy, she's on top of things and <laughs> told us she was immediately gonna start reviewing salaries and deductions. So I'm sure this is being done, um, which again is, is very, it, it's, it's pleasant to hear that what we recommend that the district take, you know, really takes to heart and wants to rectify any recommendations or, or errors that we may find. And that is, that is the only recommendation that we had as part of this audit. Like I mentioned before, we'd normally go over activity funds, but that we did not find any issues this year with the auditing of the activity funds. And that would make up my presentation. Any questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, in the, the second review that you were talking about in yep. the, uh, who would do that? Would it, would it be incumbent upon us to do it? Or? No, it would be uh, Stacy or someone within the, um, someone within the central office staff. I, that I understand would, that. I, I understand that. I meant, would it be, is it that Stacy does it twice or? No, the payroll, Jack, who is the payroll person, right. is the initial person to enter this information into ENCODE. Mm -hmm. And then once he would be through with that, Stacy would go in and do her second review. I see. So it's a kind of a redundant, it's a redundancy in this. Um, so we do, you do it twice, is it? That's, um, we, it's you, our responsibility to do it. It's just because it's, it's done, it has to be done manually. Mm -hmm. You have to enter, they have to enter the, you know, each of the contracted salaries manually into the payroll system because payroll is done in-house. There's a possibility that somebody, you know, that when you're typing in somebody's salary, that they could transpose a number and that would result in somebody getting paid an incorrect amount. So by one person entering it and then a second person reviewing what that initial person has entered, they, the, it eliminates the, the error that could, that could happen. I understand, but thank you. You're welcome. I can't see if anybody else's hand raised. Um, is there anything you go back to regular screen? Sure. Thanks, Amy. You're welcome. Does anyone have a question? I just have a comment, Janie, and I know Amy said at the very beginning, but I know Stacy's on and um, just want to recognize her for all of her hard work. Um, that was... we, we are a $50 million business. So I think sometimes people forget that we're a $50 million business and uh, the books that Stacy keeps and the internal procedures that she oversees here in the office. Um, she does an absolutely amazing job in watching over the finances of RSU 14 and 
um, huge amount of pressure and uh, she does it with um, just incredible, incredible skills and has just done an amazing job in this district for a number of years and, and should be recognized for that because it is an enormous task that has been put on her shoulders. We do have internal checks, but um, you know, there's a lot that she's required and a lot of people with finances running through the buildings that she needs to make sure that they're following procedures as well. And she does it and does it well. And so just wanna take this opportunity to recognize her for that. I'm glad you especially, said that. Especially this year and, and now with CARES and CARES money and everybody is just overwhelmed with everything that's going on, so. Well, I agree. I, that was on my list to say thank you to Stacy. especially thank you from the board for all that you do. Okay, um, thanks very much, Amy. It's always um, a delight. Dif different you. this year, but yes. we made it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Okay, it's now time for a transportation update. Mr. Kelly is here. Mr. Kelly's tired. <laughs> It's been a long day. Um, thanks for inviting me uh, to give an update on transportation um, uh, this evening. Um, it's been a long three months, to say the least. Actually, let's go back probably four months. And um, as you well know, we went the model that we're in, the hybrid model, uh, we actually started probably the latter part of July and working in uh, conjunction with the surveys. There was two surveys during the month of August we were finally able to determine as to who was writing, who wasn't writing um, for students. And the challenge was to try to balance the buses, especially with the limited amount of ridership, especially for the most part, it was limited to 26 unless you had blended families or uh, siblings. There was, I think the first couple days of school, it was, um, it was a little difficult for the reason that we thought um, those students that may have been in A or B cohorts, um, they would switch within some of the schools. And of course, um, we had some difficulty with um, information going uh, being passed back and forth between some of the schools and us, but we worked it out. And <clears throat> so we are where we are today. Um, things have um, actually balanced out pretty well. We still have some challenges, especially with some of the um, the buses up along th uh, Route 302 and the daycares. That's what puts a lot of pressure on us. And uh, we made some adjustments on that as well. And periodically we have some parents that are requesting um, if their children can start riding the bus. And depending on our ridership numbers, and we actually update that every week. So we know what's uh, the bus capacity um, on each route. But, um, it will continue to be a challenge. And I think uh, when we come back after break, we'll see what that looks like. Because some of the buses are pretty stressed. And I think there's probably a handful of buses um, that are stressed. And believe it or not, um, some of the more stressed buses are the high school, middle school buses in Raymond on the PM route. And the reason being is because in the morning we have the three tier appro uh, approach with the buses. In the afternoon, we actually go to two tiers. So we combine the middle school and the, um, the high school in the afternoon. So it starts pushing buses close to um, their capacity. But so far we've been able to work through it. So it's worked well. Um, some of the things that we, <clears throat> excuse me, accomplished too is that um, between the school budget, the Volkswagen grant and um, some of the CARES money, we were able to uh, purchase six buses. The sixth one should be here uh, probably Friday or possibly Monday, so we can complete those transactions before the end of the year. Uh, we were able to um, purchase six vans. We changed the approach as to how we uh, do vans. It, it's as far as purchasing. That's because the um, the market has changed dramatically in the used uh, used vehicle market. And of course, it makes better sense to buy new. So that's what we've been doing so far is buying new vans. And we've been successful in buying um, either 20, uh, 2020s or 2021s. Um, and so replace what we had and we're able to accommodate what we thought because of 
Um, the limited capacity in the vans too. It could either be, um, depending if there was an aide in the van or not, it could be two children, one driver or one child and two adults in the vehicle. So we're able to accomplish that and it's worked well. And of course, um, as far as that ridership, there was several students that chose to go remote. And so that assisted us. And so we have a lot more flexibility in the, um, in the vans. The challenge that we have presently, because we see it at the beginning of, um, uh, sometimes during the month of August at, uh, at different times and places, people are leaving, either they want to retire, they just didn't want to come back under the conditions that we are currently experiencing. So we lost approximately seven people at that point. And um, at the very beginning, we were at the, uh, at some points we were the break, at the breaking point as far as having available drivers. It was actually a day or so that where I was dealing with the superintendent as far as talking about not being able to bring, um, take home, uh, students home. But we worked through it. And I think the saving grace, and it's, um, it wasn't, it's not a positive, and especially with athletics, being limited, we were able to use some of these sports strip drivers. And we typically don't do that and they're not willing to do it. But um, so do people, some of those folks have been absolutely awesome and they've been helping us as much as they can. So that's how we were able to accomplish what we're doing. Presently, um, the only spare drivers that we do have, and we just had one that was licensed a couple days ago, Besides uh, my assistant director, Aaron, um, my other assistant, Rebecca, um, those are the only two spares that we have, but we just had somebody else licensed, but he's still training as far as um, driving bus with students on the bus. So every day we come in, uh, we're concerned, and but we're making it through. And so we're bringing uh, students to, to and from school. Um, one of the more exciting things that we're engaging in right now because of the CARES money and we had this discussion probably several weeks ago. We'll look into um, place tablets in the uh, school buses. It's called Tyler Drive. It accomplishes several different things. And what it does, it replaces the, um, what we call the pre-trip and post-trip um, uh, inspections that we have to do on the buses. We can do it right on the tablet. The other piece that we can do, which is important, right now we're doing, um, it's paper-based is that we're doing student attendance on a daily basis. We prepare those on a monthly basis. So that way we know who's on the bus and who's off the bus. And we also know for contact uh, tracing purposes, who is on that bus on any particular day. So what we're able to do is accomplish this through the tablet itself and store everything electronically. The third and <clears throat> last piece, as far as what we're gonna be doing is um, it's tracking the students as far as when they come on the bus and off the bus. So we know on any given day, sometimes did so-and-so ride the bus or did they not ride the bus? We know who is on the bus. And if, um, so there's two ways we can accomplish that. It's through a, um, it's a RFID card or the drivers can check the student on the bus and off the bus too. So we just received the uh, hardware. It's gonna be installed over the weekend. And the initial phases of the training is going to take place starting Friday. The second phase is probably over the vacation period and the drivers will get their last piece of training probably about mid-January. So it will be a process before we refine it will probably be towards the latter part of the school year, but it's something exciting for us because I think it's part of how we're advancing uh, technology within transportation. Um, there's a couple things here and there as far as um, it was a challenge at first having drivers get uh, accustomed to um, cleaning the buses, the masks, um, everything associated with that, changing out um, some of the cleaning solutions, things of that sort, but they've refined that. It's worked pretty well. And much to the driver's credit, um, the attendance has been, for the most part, outstanding as what it's been uh, compared to what it's been in years past. So um, all in all, it's, it's worked well. We've had a lot of challenges. I think one of the things internally that um, hurt us and I was concerned is that I have a driver route coordinator works inside the office with us, which is critical. And especially the enormous amount of work that we had to do just to prepare for the beginning of school. And it's, um, as I would term it, it's all hands on deck. And the person that was in that particular position 
did not feel comfortable in the environment that um, he was in and he chose to resign. So it was my assistant and myself and I was actually rather panicked. And lo and behold, um, somebody that had, uh, was a former director uh, where Christine was from, came on board, he was absolutely brilliant. And I mean, he was a saving grace, we made it through. But then again, a, a lifelong ambition that he had, he wanted to sell school buses. So he left us after six weeks, but he got us over the hump. And that was wonderful. The position is still vacant, um, but we're making it through. And um, I think the other piece that we're experiencing too is that because of the reduced ridership on the buses, our student discipline issues are almost non-existent. So, which is a positive. So it goes back to, we know that the higher ridership and a closer proximity that children are to each other, we always have those challenges as trying to manage behavior, but it's worked well. The children have been excellent for the most part. We, you know, we have a couple challenges here and there, but it's worked well. And uh, moving forward, we're positive. We're looking forward like everybody else to get back to what we call so-called normal. And um, hopefully that's right on the horizon too. So thank you. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Had a question? I do, Mike. Um, refresh my memory. I know we were told, but the uh, the new electronic equipment uh, that's going on the buses to be able to, you know, tell who's on what bus, et cetera, when they get on. Right. Were we able to purchase enough for every bus? Um, how we do it? The tablets are interchangeable. So what we did is we have docking stations for all the buses. Okay, so. What we did is um, all the buses that um, our primary buses are equipped with tablets. If we have to go to a spare bus, all we do is remove the tablet from that bus and we put it on the other bus. So we purchased actually 28 tablets. And so we have 25 uh, for the so-called everyday buses. We have three spare in case one, um, we have issues with it. And so we can plug it right into the bus. And so there's a plan. And like I said, any bus, in the fleet itself can um, re, uh, receive the tablet itself if we have to swap out. Great, thank you. Sure. Uh, Pete? Mike, thank you. Um, you know, for everything that you do, when I <coughs> sit back and try to think about all the things that you have to plan, all the moving pieces, all the routes, the drivers, um, the trips for athletics, which aren't really happening now, but when they do, I mean, there's just so much. And uh, I think we're really lucky to have you. So thank you on that. Um, my question is last year, it seemed like all we talked about was um, motorist passing stop school buses. Right. And, and we had the big initiative to do the stop arms, the extended stop arms. And this year I heard a single mention of any issue with that. So can you just talk about how that's going? I think Mike might be frozen. Oh. <laughs> Do you have any insight for us, Mr. Howell? I, I know that we have, one of the things that was, uh, when we had the downtime with the buses from March until the beginning of the school year, um, Transportation was able to install a number of those arms, Pete, as well as uh, in addition to the new buses that we're ordering or we're ordering them through with that. I've not heard of the issues that we've had in the past with people passing, and I don't know if that's a function of uh, people being more cognizant or if it truly is a function that those extended stop arms in those busy places are, in fact, taking care of the issues and, um, you know, people are doing what they need to be doing. So it looks like Mike is back. Yeah, I'm sorry I lost the connection for some reason and probably the cheap internet I have over here. But anyways, <laughs> um, Pete, I was um, I heard the last part of your question and it had to do with uh, motors passing school buses and that's where it um, ended. Yeah, and Mike, I was just asking, um, I mean, it's, it's a great thing not to hear about that this year. And I was just wondering if you could talk to it as um, as to what you might know uh, if it's the effectiveness of the stop arms, if it's um, education on the part of the motorists? Um, it's hard to say. Um, it's the extended stop arms, <clears throat> excuse me, 
are helping because um, people are more aware of the bus stopping because of obviously the um, the extension of the arm into the um, into the middle of the road. But the other part Pete, that we're facing, and it, I think it's getting worse before it's uh, getting better, is the aggressive driving that's going on right now. So it was a combination of we put the stop stop arms in there. We're more um, aggressive as far as we're trying to work in conjunction with the police department and better reporting by the drivers. But the other piece too that I found, especially when we wa uh, watching the video with more frequency, it's the habits that the drivers have um, gotten used to as far as when they approach a stop. And um, we talked about it at the beginning of the year and we've had a couple of discussions about it in that a driver is so used to routine is that they'll approach a stop, they'll activate their yellow lights and all of a sudden they're automatically engaging their red lights. So the bus is about to come to a stop or is at a stop and they're not gauging the traffic coming at them. So if you're observing the traffic in front of you, you're recognizing the fact that that driver may or may not stop. And so you have to um, be able to judge when you're going to activate your uh, red lights. Because once you activate those red lights, it starts a whole nother sequence as far as what's going on. So we're drilling that into driver's heads. And I, we just had an incident, I think it was about three weeks ago. And um, it was actually on 302. And it was a high school student that was standing on the, um, the white line for the breakdown lane. And the driver made the mistake of activating the red lights as the vehicle was approaching. And of course the student was approaching the roadway at the same time. So it was all anticipation by the driver, by the student and things of that sort. So what we're doing is we're taking the video and trying to educate the driver too. And in this particular case, we actually talked to the dad because the dad called, he was upset because you know, his son told him a story. But the whole story was that people are anticipating certain things happening based on the red lights going on on the bus. But in fact, is that um, people had to exercise some patience too. So that's the other part of the equation too. It's an education thing all the way around. All right, thank you. Sure. Uh, Mike, I wanna echo what Pete had to say. Um, I think we all do about the way that you're having to juggle all these routes and people and times and and you're doing it with a lot of grace. So thank you very much. And please give our thanks to all the people that you work with that we don't see because we appreciate them too. Well, I really appreciate that. And um, you know, it's interesting. I look back and I said to you folks uh, before, um, um, it'll be about third, uh, here almost 13 years. And the quality of people that we have, not to say um, that we did not have good people in the past, but um, the group of people that we have today is that they're a great group of people. And it's interesting how some just happen to come in. And of course, I look at the people that we have in place. I call them, um, most of them are homegrown, meaning that they come in there, they have very little experience. They may have a commercial driving license, but they don't have their school bus license, but we train right from the ground up. And I think probably right now, I dare say, um, probably 75% of the people that we have on board us, we trained ourselves. And um, so that helps. And I think the other piece um, of the equation that we have too is that we've utilized what we call um, on-site spares. And so these are folks that obviously don't have the benefit of positions, but it allows us, when we have people on board, to evaluate somebody over the long run, and you know, we and we can make the judgment whether or not they're they're a good a fit for the uh, say for the bus route or the position. And some routes obviously are higher than others. So if we're going to bring somebody on board, we try to adjust people based on their skill set and what is more difficult or what's less difficult, so they can succeed. So it's helped uh, right along, and that's why we have a good group of people. Thanks, uh, Marge. Uh, one last question, Mike. Now that you um, and your crew have been down at the new garage down mm -hmm. with Public Works, how's that working out for everybody? It's working well. Um, I dare say I've been in the public sector the better part of my working life. And being a little selfish, it's the best office I've ever had. It's better than the superintendent's. <laughs> I know he's jealous. <laughs> but... Um, it works well. I think there were some hiccups um, during the transition. 
And there's always a little issue here and there, but you know, for the most part, um, it works well. And people, anyone that comes into the facility, they just look around and they're just amazed how beautiful it is. And so, I mean, it's been a long road. We've done well. And I, I mean, if we have um, some little challenges internally, we work through it and we're just grateful for what we have. I just, one last question, Jenny. Sure. Um, the, um, the bus, the wash, I'm really yep. curious if that ever gets straightened out as to, I know it was kicking back dirty water because I'm always concerned about the undercarriage of the bus naturally. Right. right. It's, it, it has been resolved. Um, and what we're doing, and especially part of the, um, the cleaning procedure that we have now, and of course we're getting into that time of year where the salt and dirt are on the road. Um, what we're making at a point because when we have the drivers clean the buses, um, it's usually um, after their morning run, their afternoon run. What we're doing on Thursdays is that we are having them not clean the bus after their afternoon run, because and then we're having them come in on Friday mornings and we're taking them through the wash bay and cleaning them up. So it's worked well. It's it is working well, and so we're staying ahead of it. Good. Hopefully, we'll get a, a longer life. <laughs> absolutely a but little bit we've had the benefit though of um as i mentioned earlier of having six new buses and we actually took some of the buses and we um, we're not holding on to all the equipment there were some of the oldest stuff even though it was like 2008 we just um, were sending that to auction next week because the um the salt damage to them, um, especially, I mean, the rot and the rust and all that stuff, it's not worth keeping and just throwing money at it. And just the, the body repairs are, you know, you start getting into thousands of dollars. So uh, hopefully it will just um, down the road. We'll, we'll know 10 years from now, or at least somebody will know, not me. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thanks. thanks. We really appreciate it. All right. Okay. Uh, could I have a motion, Jenny? Yes, I move to approve Women's Studies and Life 101 as new courses at Wyndham High School for the 2022 20, school year. Second. It's been moved by Jenny, seconded by uh, Kate. Any public comment? Marge, will you wait just a second? Any public comment? Okay, any board comment? Marge. Okay, quick question. Um, is there any additional cost to these programs, Chris? There aren't any additional costs. Um, the women's studies, there may be a couple new texts that need to be purchased, but they'd be purchased through existing budget funds. And then Life 101, which has been a course for a number of years, there weren't any additional costs related to that. Thank you. Okay, any other board discussion? All those in favor? Marge Gavoni? Yes. Jenny Cummings? Aye. Christina Small? Yes. Kate Bricks? Yes. Anna Keeney? Yes. Jenny Butler? Yes. Pete Hensler? Aye. Scott McLean? Yay. Okay. <laughs> motion carries. Okay, now budget timeline. Mr. Well, it's hard to believe that we are approaching once again um, budget time. It seems like we just finished the budget, just voted on it in July, and now we hear here we are again, starting the, the process again. So right now the administrators are um, working on their individual building budgets and looking at internal needs. We are very cognizant in the budget this year that. State revenues have been hit really, really hard, and um, we do not yet have a financial picture of what state subsidy is going to look like. I think everyone is expecting to be at best uh, funded at the same level and at worst to either see a curtailment or to see a reduction in funding for the RSU for next year and what our state requirement or not our state requirement, our state subsidy is. So uh, we are already in the midst of preparing as a conservative budget as we can. Uh, and so the administrative team members have until uh, we get back from the holiday break in order to be able to finish up their budgets. The first budget meeting for the board will be on 
uh, Wednesday, February 3rd, and there's a budget calendar that's in your folders. That will be an opportunity to have a budget workshop with the A-team to learn a little bit about the tenor of the budget, what we've been working on, and then also um, if we're gonna see any significant changes. And at this point, uh, it looks like February 24th, Wednesday night, uh, last week of February is when I'll be presenting to the board uh, my recommended budget. And then we have that opportunity to turn it over to all of you. Uh, something that's a little different this year in March is that there are five Wednesdays in March. Um, so five Wednesdays, uh, typically we would have uh, three or four meetings during that time. And so as we get closer to those dates, we'll work with leadership and um, look at what dates are gonna be devoted to, to finance, which then puts us always in the place of trying to have a recommended budget to the public by um, people leaving for April break, that first week of April. And at this point, it looks like the public budget meeting will be held on May 19th, uh, whether or not that's gonna be in the auditorium or whether or not that'll be virtual this year. Uh, we'll wait and see. And also, and one other interesting thing this year is with meetings being remote. I know in the past we've had to cancel meeting for snow days. We may still be able to hold remote meetings and move through the budget process. So Pete, I know you had a question. Yeah, Chris, did you mention February 24th as a date? February 24th, Wednesday night. Yeah, when is school vacation in February? School vacation is the 15th through the 19th. 15th through the 19th. All right, perfect, thank you. Yeah, it's the week following. So if there aren't any questions, um, and then we would be voting, it looks like, uh, I would say I'm not gonna be voting because I don't live in Wyndham or Raymond, but the public will be voting on June 8th. Any other questions about the budget timeline? Okay, let's move on to the superintendent's report. Sure, so a uh, couple things to share tonight. Uh, first of all, just some good news from New England Association of Schools and Colleges, where the two year progress report for Wyndham High School for their accreditation. Um, those of you who might be new to the board, uh, Wyndham High School's accreditation was completed in 2018. Uh, so this is the two-year report and um, some great commendations for the work that Wyndham High School has done in towards meeting some of the recommendations. And many of those recommendations uh, were around engaging the public and engaging parents into the process, as well as creating clear learning standards and targets for all the courses that are offered it had been done for many of the core. So some great commendations from um, the group about that. And for their five-year progress report, looking at continued opportunities for cross-disciplinary learning, um, process for feedback on instructional practices from multiple sources, including teachers, supervisors, parents, um, looking at common assessments and looking at some of the work the wellness committee is doing but it's uh, a great thing for Ryan to receive today. In fact, I don't even know, I'm sure if he's opened his email on that. I probably did, but um, great piece of report. Uh, also happy to report that um, at Jordan Small Middle School that we have some recognitions for the stock market game. Uh, oh. First place elementary school division, uh, second place elementary school division and first place middle school division for stock market. Uh, that Jack Fitch does and helps to mentor. And Jack is working remotely this year, but working remotely with kids. And so some great recognition. Uh, so first place middle school student, Maya Fitz, first place elementary student, Alexis Perrin, and second place elementary, Malcolm Mori. So great, great job by all these students who are investing wisely and doing very, very well in the stock market game. And so lastly, um, more of a serious topic. Uh, it is December 16th and um, we are still able to offer in-person learning through hybrid for um, RSU 14. And we have um, so far to date, we've had 25 
confirmed COVID cases that have impacted our buildings. Uh, in addition to that, we have cases that have impacted families and impacted members of our community. And you know, one of the things that I have to keep reminding myself because I know the community has seen so many letters from me and updates and um, is that first of all, anytime we talk about a COVID update, it's a person and it's a family that's dealing with an illness. Um, and the last thing that we wanna do is shame a family because an illness of, in the middle of a pandemic. So something that I have to keep reminding myself in my communications and also in my mindset that as quick as we wanna to go to problem solve, there's also some wraparound pieces that we wanna do for families. But uh, you know, one of the questions that I receive most often, and um, there's an article I've written for Lake Region, which will come out on, I think in Friday's edition, you know, what do we use and, and, and how do we determine whether or not we're gonna stay open? And so first of all, staying open, um, you know, schools right now are providing social, emotional and academic support for, for our kids. Um, even in our remote program with our remote students, they are interacting with a live person. And uh, while many districts have gone to software programs, we have kids with live people on Zoom or kids with live people and I just believe that that's so important for the social emotional health. So to the extent that um, we have the staffing, to the extent that we have safe schools, which we absolutely do, um, we will continue to do all that we can through this process to make sure that, um, that kids can continue to come to school. Um, one, of the, one of the phenomenon that we're seeing right now in our cases is that a case is identified uh, we need to quarantine students and staff members, but what we're not seeing is transmission in those quarantine groups. Um, individuals are home for their assigned period of time. When their quarantine time is over, they're returning back to school. Uh, and Rick had mentioned an update that came from Maine DOE and CDC on the health guidelines. That's actually within the first two or three paragraphs is that statewide uh, they're not seeing transmission happening in, in cases that are appearing in school. Uh, and so what we're most often dealing with is a case that came through a family, someone comes to school, they exhibit symptoms, and then we're, we're looking to quarantine. And uh, it is quite a process when we work through that quarantining process. Um, so far, and I'm thankful for it, that as an organization, we've been able to stay open through um, you know, the long-term subs that you have supported. I think Ryan mentioned this in his last presentation to those that you've supported um, through Mike Kelly and some supportive work for working on spares and other people to make sure that we're fully staffed. Uh, but to the extent that we can continue to provide that in-person experience, that connection for our kids, uh, we're gonna continue to do that. The, the other thing that I wanna mention, and I think sometimes people forget is that elementary schools, middle schools, high schools are, are part of the economic engine that runs our community. And by having schools open, it's allowing our parents to go to work, to make sure that their kids are in a safe spot. And um, so the extent that we're able to stay open and able to have parents be able to continue to remain employed, whether that be regularly employed, underemployed, or the other phenomenon we're seeing within our district is, uh, as the pandemic continues with people who are just unemployed and unable to find work. And so being able to stay open so that people continue to do work. So we will continue to do that. We will continue to maintain safe schools, uh, which I am so proud of our teachers and our students and our support staff for the work that they've done in order to be able to do that. Uh, but as long as we can continue to do that in some capacity, we're gonna keep our schools open and continue to support our community. So. Uh, it is a day-by-day -day basis where we're looking to make those decisions and to see where we're at. Uh, but again, it's December 16th and uh, you know, we've been able to provide this service to our families and we hope that through the rest of this year and into the new year that we will continue to be able to do that. Marge, you had a question? Uh, I do. Um, my heart goes out to Dr. Nick and the chamber singers. Um, oh. Have you, do you have any information? Have you heard anything on there being any changes and what's happening with, with choral singers, et cetera? Yeah, well, there was actually, and Rick referred to it today. And I think of the copy I had, I put on Christine's desk of the updated guidance. Uh, but really it's, it's down to this is that for choral 
um, choral activities are still not actually um, encouraged in any school districts right now because of the social distancing requirements. Uh, and so the guidance is pretty clear unless it's outdoors and that you have 14 feet of distance and kids are evenly spaced, um, not really supporting that. The, the, the guidance that came out today was about elective band, orchestra, jazz band opportunities with some now provisions for kids playing with uh, double cloth coverings over bells, uh, specific, very specific guidelines for spit valves. I've never written, uh, read that much information about a spit <laughs> valve, but there's now state guidance on how you operate your spit valve, uh, masks with slits in them in order to be able to do that. Um, and so it looks like there might be some opportunity for some elective band things, but as far as singing goes, right now, um, there's nothing that's permitted through Maine CDC and Maine DOE for that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I can go ahead and um, if anyone's interested, it's now, I think, I don't know if it's posted on the DOE website, we were kind of received a preview copy, but I can throw it in the board packet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the last four pages have to do with music. Thank you. Um, oh, Scott. Chris, did you just say masks with slits in them? <laughs> I did. I did for, and specifically for um, elective music. Like to play an oboe? I, I get it. <laughs> I'm going to leave it right there, folks. <laughs> Okay, Pete. All right. Um, Marge asked the exact question that I was going to ask, but I want to take it further um, as far as the chamber singers. Like, how does, how does somebody advocate for them? Um, you know, you've got a pretty big position uh, as president of the Superintendents Association or whatever, and... Uh, yeah. You know, we have it here in Augusta because as a parent um, and just as a as an observer, there's a lot of things that don't make sense. Um, how a basketball team, you know, that has close contacts where they might even be bumping up against each other and they wear a mask and but then we can't have somebody that's singing six feet apart. I mean, there's a lot of things that don't make sense and I can empathize um, with the chamber singers and how you know, there seems to be some inequity. So if there's a way for school boards to write collective letters and or mm -hmm. for, you know, superintendents to advocate, I'd like to know the ways to do that. Yeah, and it's actually, uh, Pete, it's uh, Commissioner Lambrew through the main, main Department of Health and Human Services with CDC falling under. She's ultimately responsible for the guidelines that have come out. Uh, we have shared as a county group our disappointment with the length of time that it's taken for music uh, because one thing that's been very clear through this process is that it seems like athletics has had the ear of policymakers in Augusta, but not the performing arts. Yeah. Uh, and so we have been vocal about it as a superintendent's group. There have been, um, a couple of boards, I believe South Portland and maybe Brunswick and Freeport may have done some board letters um, doing some encouragement. It's been, I brought it up multiple times with the commissioner on the Thursday um, meetings that I have and um, specifically to choral. So it looks like some band stuff might be moving forward but choral activities not moving forward. So um, we'll continue to push the issue but you know, doing a shared letter as a board might be something we want to take a look at or it's on my leadership list um mrs bricks had her hand up to that point i i would concur if it was the will of the entire board to send a letter um the thing that was most powerful for me aside from it's always great to hear from students but the final monologue from dr nick was I felt extremely powerful. 
And I would like to suggest that we send that with his permission um, along with a letter. Um, it's one thing to get a letter from the board, but I think it's another thing to hear from the horse's mouth, the truly, truly impact it has on that popular demographic in our schools. Can we do that? Okay. Absolutely. We'll pursue that. Uh, Marge? Um, I, think we, <clears throat> I think we all received the same letter from um, Mr. Diamond. Um, would it help to also have, get him involved in this? Um, he's in Augusta and mm -hmm. I think he made the statement if there was anything he could do. Um, so wouldn't it help if we could get those folks on board? That's a good idea. I, I, um, I think that's a good idea. Yep. Okay. So how, how do we go forward with that? I guess would be my next question. Chris, somebody? No, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to reach out to our, um, our legislative delegation. They are, they're very responsive uh, and whatever pressure that they can put through the governor's office to, to do this, what, whatever that change might be. Um, I know athletics has had quite a presence and have been able to push some things. Uh, I also know, and Rick, Wrench, uh, Dr. Nickerson mentioned it in his, um, you know, his words that he shared that Maine music educators have written some very powerful letters to Commissioner Lambrew and to the governor's office and to Commissioner Macon about moving some of these rules and some of these uh, ideas. So um, I, I think it would be a wonderful idea in support of our students for something to come from the board. Uh, as well as to contact those. So I would be more than happy to contact the, our, our delegation. They're very responsive again and um, see what we can do. All right, and we'll talk about it tomorrow as well. Okay, could I have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. It's been moved by Marge, seconded by Pete. All those in favor? Marge Cavoni? Yes. Kate Bricks? Yes. Scott McLean? Yay. Jenny Cummings? Yes. Christina Small? Yes. Anna Keeney? Yes. Jenny Butler? Yes. And Pete Hensler? Aye. Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Thank you. See you all in the next, in the new year. Back at you all. Take care. Bye. Bye.